It's a real joy to get to be with you. And uh, if you would like, take your Bible and look to the book of Amos. We're looking in chapter 1. And Chris said that I uh, pastored several churches in Ohio and Indiana. It's actually three churches. I, I pastored for about 14 and a half years altogether. Um, one for two years while I was in seminary, and then I was a church planter with uh, what was then called uh, the Home Mission Board, now the North American Mission Board. But um, I served with them and was at a church in Ohio for uh, about eight and a half years at that church plant, and then came back to Southern to work on my PhD in Old Testament and pastored a church for four years in New Albany, Indiana. But when I started at Southern, they always take uh, biographical information and put it in their materials and now on their website to introduce their professors. <clears throat> and uh, what they had with me is that I pastored uh, 14 churches in three years as opposed to three churches in 14 and a half years. And so, uh, yeah, I was just buzzing through them, just one after another. <laughs> That's what that was. You'd be amazed at how many years it took for that to get out of the materials. Once it's in there, it is hard to get it out. And so, but my father's the one that saw that, and he, he was a pastor, and uh, he said, that doesn't look good. He, he said, you need to get that fixed. So uh, hopefully it is. But um, yes, it's easy for me to count my time at uh, um, Southern because I started in 2001, so I can just start with one. So... Um, I'm in my 23rd year since this is 22, um, so by the end of this year, it will be 23 years that I've been there full time, and I taught as an adjunct um, before that, but uh, it's been a real joy, and your pastor and I uh, have known each other all those years, his office before he became the dean um, at our school in the School of Theology um, his office was, uh, if uh, there was an office across from me, his was the next one across the hall, just, just right there. And so um, we've uh, known each other um, for all these years. And again, I'm so grateful that uh, your pastoral staff has called me um, and asked me to uh, be with you this morning. Well, when we look at the book of Amos, <clears throat> this is... Uh, uh, a wonderful book, and I, I want you to think about this. Um, I asked my wife this last night, and uh, uh, I tried things on her, and it, it didn't go so well, but I decided to go with it anyhow. Um, but I want you to think of uh, a person that you know of in, in your lifetime. Um, so it's in your lifetime, or it can be even in history, um, but uh, not someone in the Bible, okay? So we'll, we'll put, put that off of uh, our, our answer um, key here. But um, think of a person that did something, that was just an ordinary person that did something super ordinary. Someone that's just, just a regular ordinary person you can think of in your life that did something really extraordinary, have you thought about that person? Can you think of someone there? Some of you know, some of you yes. Um, now, I know this is a large room, but I'm used to people talking back to me, okay? And so, uh, so I'm going to ask any of you, tell, tell us any, uh, any, anyone you think of. Anyone that you can think of that did something extraordinary, that was just an ordinary person. Yeah, there you go. That's exactly right. And he's from Ohio, right? So am I. So see, see, I know that. See, so, yeah, but that's right. Yeah, John Glenn. Great backstory, right? To see what he came from and what he accomplished. Absolutely. Anyone else? Yeah, Billy Graham. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, who'd have thought that the Lord would bless his ministry the way it did when, when you look at the history and his beginnings? Absolutely. Who else? Yes, sir. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln, absolutely. And so it's, it's an amazing thing when we think about how God often uses ordinary people also in his kingdom's work to do great things. And that's the case with Amos. 
Um, Amos was just an ordinary person. And so as we start our study, um, I want us to look at uh, something about who he is and uh, move on from that. So in verse 1 of chapter 1, um, it says, The words of Amos, who was one of the sheep breeders from Tekoa, what he saw regarding Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And so I want to talk about this and then move on from there. But let's have a word of prayer and we'll do just that then, okay? Our Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. What a joy and privilege it is to study your word. And even, a, even a, an added blessing that we can study it with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, we pray that you will lead us in this study and that we will be receptive. I pray, Father, that you would help me to communicate what you would have me to communicate and that all that I say is pleasing to you and faithful to your word. And I pray that Jesus Christ will be lifted up and all that is said and done. And it is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, uh, it starts out then with the words of Amos, who was one of the sheep breeders from Tekoa. So what can we know about Amos the man? What can we know about him? Um, the truth is the book gives us very little information about Amos and what we can know about him. Um, what we can know is this, his name in uh, the, Old, the Old Testament, as you know, most of it was written originally in Hebrew. So his name in Hebrew literally means to load or to carry a load or burden. So it's either to load something or more likely um, used in the, the Old Testament to carry a load or a burden. And so this points to Amos because he is called by God to carry a heavy burden because the message that he is going to, to deliver will not be well received at all by his audience and it will be a tough message for him to deliver um, given its contents. And so it could be that uh, there's a connection with that. Some have suggested, which I kind of think this is interesting, I don't know that it's the case and, and I'm not sure so much that it is, but some have suggested that this is what the people who heard him preach called him. If it means burden or load, um, the idea that he's a burden to them and that he is kind of like in our vernacular to say someone's a pain in the neck, that they saw Amos coming and called him a burden and that he was a troublemaker and that uh, he was a pain to them and uh, putting a heavy message on them. And so that's possible um, because he was not well received and they did see many of them, most of them, they saw him as a burden um, by what he was preaching to them because he was not telling them what they wanted to hear. And then another idea, um, looking at his name, it's possible Amos' name could mean one sustained by Yahweh. And certainly this is the case because in his ministry, he is opposed on every side and the Lord sustained him in this work so that's what we can see at least uh, from his name it also says that he was among the sheep herders of Tekoa now Tekoa um, is in the southern part of Israel in the region called Judah and uh, at his time um, the nation of Israel, which had been one, had, was split, and uh, there are 12 tribes in Israel. Ten of them lived in the north, and they were called the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. The southern kingdom was actually called Judah. And so what we have here is uh, Amos is actually from Judah, and he grew up and lived about 10 to 11 miles south of Jerusalem, um, five miles from Bethlehem and uh, not far from the Dead Sea as well. And he lived kind of on a cutting edge of, uh, of the area because if you went east of where he lived, it was what they called the wilderness. If you went 
um, west. It was fertile ground. And in the area where he is, near Bethlehem, of course, we know David grew up in this region as well. This is a region of shepherding and herding. And so it, it makes sense as it says that he was among the sheep herders of Tekoa. Now, one of the things about this is we think about his, his job um, being among the sheep herders. It's most likely he was not a shepherd, though, like David. But uh, the word that's used for him is actually he was a businessman in the area of herding or sheep herding. So it's, he's not one of those guys that was out in the field necessarily. He was the one that was exchanging money and paying people and, and taking care of the business end of it. But he was very much involved in an um, <clears throat> enterprise that uh, was common to the, the people in his day. And so he was a part of that business. Also, we see that um, in, in chapter um, 7 and, uh, and, uh, and other places, we see that he was one who was involved in um, growing figs. And this probably is tied to um, his herding business. And it, my guess is that he was probably using those to feed um, his herds and that sort of thing. So he was involved <clears throat> in herding. Um, he was involved in a little bit of, of uh, um, farming as well in that sense. And this is what he was doing. And he was very much a businessman um, taking care uh, of these things. And again, as I talk about him um, being an ordinary man, People in, <clears throat> in Old Testament times especially, and I would even argue um, mostly in the New Testament as well, the people in ancient Israel and Judah, they were part of one of two businesses. Either they were out in the fields farming or they were out in pastures herding. And so those were the main businesses that people were involved in, either farming or herding. And it just so happens that we see that Amos kind of had his hand in both aspects of it, which means that he was as ordinary as anyone can be because it was no big deal because er almost everyone in their culture, besides those who were actually involved in the selling end of it, who would go to town and, and sell, um, they were involved in farming or herding. And so this is the man that God called to go to the north from the south where he was and to preach a message to these people in Israel. And he comes from a very common background. And so Amos' background reminds me that God calls ordinary people quite often to do his service. I think sometimes if we're not careful, we think that God is calling um, people with extraordinary talents and uh, extraordinary backgrounds and uh, have a pedigree of some kind to do what they do. And yes, sometimes that, that may happen. We see someone like uh, Isaiah. He was a part of the noble family. He was related to the king. And uh, we see others like Jeremiah, who was uh, a member of a, a priestly family and Ezekiel, who was a priest and a prophet both. And so, yes, there were those, but there were those like Amos, who was just a businessman doing his thing, and God called him from that business, and he was faithful to God's call upon his life. I think about Micah. Um, he ministered during the same time of Isaiah. Isaiah is a part of the nobility. He's He's doing his ministry in the city of Jerusalem with all the nobility there and preaching to the leadership of that country. While Micah was a country boy preaching the same message, and I have to tell you, I, I think I might prefer to hear Micah's message to Isaiah's because Micah took a lot less pages to give his message. And so uh, I get the impression Isaiah was a little longer winded maybe. Um, but they had the same message basically, but one was a city boy, in the upper class, the other boy was a country boy preaching and prophesying and doing the work that God 
called him to do as well. And so God calls people from all walks of life. So the, the key, I think, for us to remember with this, there are several things I'm sure we can remember, but one thing is that we need to recognize that it's not so much our background that matters to God, it's our willingness to do what God's calling us to do. It's our faithfulness to his call upon our lives, whatever that may be, and to trust him in this. And that's, that's at the heart of the matter. And um, I think from, as we'll see later on in the study, that uh, Amos gives the impression that he did not really see himself as altogether adequate to do the work that God had called him to do, but he tells uh, the high priest up in Israel, he says, I was in, in Judah just minding my own business, literally doing the work that I was doing, and now I'm here preaching to you because God told me to. And that was it. He was willing to do whatever God called him to do, and this was the thing. And so I, I think many of us, when we look at God's call upon our lives, and we sense God calling us to, to serve him in some capacity, whatever that is, um, that uh, we often feel inadequate to, to do what God has called us to do. Let me uh, just clear your mind and your thinking on this, if, if you haven't already. If you feel inadequate to do what God has called you to do, you are inadequate. So am I. And... The Bible says that God calls the, the weak to confound the strong. He calls the foolish to confound the wise of this world. He calls those who are not to confound those who are to show that he is God and that he is the one that is using his people and it is for his glory and his sake. And so what he is looking for us to be as his people is obedient and faithful to do what he's called us to do, whatever that is, wherever that is. And so this is what we see here with Amos. And it's an amazing thing to think about this. And Jesus says in John 15, five, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's true. But what did the angel tell Mary? That with God, all things are possible. Isn't that right? And so what he's looking for us to do and to be is, is obedient and faithful to him and his call upon our lives. And that's why Amos is such a hero to me. Um, I, I, I don't know how you responded when you heard that there was, there was going to be a study in the book of Amos and that there is an Old Testament professor from Southern coming to teach that. I had a lady, this is just this last Wednesday night. I taught a class she came up to me after the class and she said, I heard that this class was going to be a class and it was in Jeremiah. She says a class on, in Jeremiah from an Old Testament professor from Southern Seminary. And I was just like, this is gonna be the worst experience of my life. And yet this is all we were offering at our church Wednesday night. That's how I get crowds. Don't offer anything else. And then they'll come to, come to hear me. Um, but that's not really true. They have discipleship groups. Others are smarter to get in those and say, I don't go to that class. But uh, the thing is that God uses ordinary people and I am excited about Amos. And this isn't a book that we typically talk, talk a lot about and think a lot about, but I'm excited about Amos the man and the book, but Amos the man because he was just a regular guy Again, minding his own business, but he loved the Lord and was willing to do whatever the Lord called him to do. And that's what the Lord wants from each of us, to be willing to do what he's called us to do. And so there was nothing really extraordinary about Amos except his faith and obedience to God to do what God has called him to do. So this is what we might know about his background, about Amos himself, but what might we know about the setting of this book? Well, one of the things I think that uh, we see here, well, look at the second part of verse one again. 
He says, what he saw regarding in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So I, again, I already mentioned that we have two kingdoms, actually. Israel is split. There's, there's a north and a south. And the north is called Israel. And the king of Israel is Jeroboam, the son of Je Jehoash. Um, we re usually refer to him as Jeroboam the second, because the first king of the northern kingdom was Jer named Jeroboam as well. So this is what we, um, who we call Jeroboam the second. And then the king in Judah, where Amos was from, was Uzziah. Now, what are some things that we can look at from the setting? The first thing is this. Amos lived during a time of national disunity then. So it wasn't one Israel, but it was a north and a south, and it was divided very much. And there was a great deal of animosity uh, among these people between the north and the south. Um, how did this animosity come about? Well, one way is the, the fathers of both of these kings had warred against each other. So we're just one generation away from an all-out war between the north and the south. And uh, people will say, well, if, if you hear in the Bible, it looks like they were at peace with one another and they were getting along. Well, they were getting along because the North beat the South, subjugated them, and made sure that they wouldn't attack them anymore. So if you want to call that getting along, I guess that's getting along. But I guarantee you the Southerners and Northerners both um, had a great deal of animosity toward one another. You don't believe that. Um, I remember uh, when I first started teaching at Southern I was teaching a class, um, a Hebrew class at the, the college, and uh, there was a young man in that class who was a, not just a Civil War buff, but um, I don't know where he was from. I think it was Virginia, but I believe that if Richmond ro rose up today and said, we're marching on Washington, he, he has his musket somewhere and he was ready to attack. And... Um, it made me a little nervous because um, I didn't have the same accent that he has um, coming from Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, he made it very clear how he felt. So I made it very clear also that my ancestors were from the South and fought on that side in the Civil War, just in case there was any problem um, that would come um, with that. And uh, I don't talk like any of my family. They, uh, my father... Um, grew up in Arkansas, my mom in the Boot Hill, Missouri, and uh, when he graduated from seminary, I was one years old, and I was the product of seminary, first of all, but uh, um, I was one year old, and they went to Cleveland, Ohio, so I don't talk like any of my family at all. I have a very different accent, although I grew up in a southern home on southern cooking and uh, southern phrases, but I don't talk like them, and so I just have to blame my dad um, for that, but uh, that's how that happened. Um, but I can tell you, if that gentleman, young man, felt that way after all these years, what well, it's been nearly over 150 years, um, this has been more like 15 to 20 years since they had their war. There was no love lost between the North and South at this time. And again, Amos is from the South, which lost the war, and the North you can look in Kings, the North made claims that they were superior and that they, here's what their king said. They said, when we go to war, he sent this message to the king of Judah. The king in the North said, you're attacking us is like a scrub brush trying to attack a great tree of, of, of Lebanon, a cedar of Lebanon. You just need to lay off. Well, that infuriated the South, of course. And they did attack, and it didn't go well. And so uh, this is where they were at this time. So there was national disunity. So they wouldn't welcome Amos or his message in the north. Second, there, this was a time of military superiority. Israel did vanquish the south and the South was much weaker, always much weaker than the North. And before they had vanquished the South, they had vanquished their longtime enemies of Syria, or Aram, often called in the Old Testament, in the North. 
And under this king, Jeroboam, they were the strongest they had ever been in their history since the time of Solomon, which is saying something, because we're talking about nearly 200 years difference. And so we have here a very strong king and a very strong nation that was fortified, that had its armies ready to go, and they feared nobody because they had not been beaten, even come close to being beaten by anybody who had fought against them. And so there was an air of superiority and this idea that we are strong and we are invincible. Now, why do I mention this? Because this becomes a problem for them and this will become a problem for the next thing I mention. And what is the problem? In Old Testament times, and let's be honest, people today, we still hold to this. And there are a lot of preachers preaching this sort of thing. And that is this. It's what um, I teach my students. We call the retribution principle. What is the retribution principle? Simply this. God blesses good people and God curses bad people. And we live by that. We think that that's how everything happens. But if you read through the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, they have a lot of trouble with this. What's the trouble? Because they all witness very bad people seeming to have very good lives and very godly people having a great deal of trouble in their lives. And so what are they to make of this? But still, they believed in this. Most of the people did. And this is Job's friends. Job's friends said what? You're suffering because you're sinning. And if you would stop your sinning, then God would bless you and you wouldn't have your trouble. When the truth is, if Job's friends had been as godly as Job, maybe they would have had the suffering happen to them because it was because of Job's godliness, actually, that he was suffering. But the belief has been, and often it is today, you will have good things if what? If you trust God. If you're faithful to God, then you'll have everything that you ever want. You'll have that job you want. You'll have that, that uh, car you want. You'll, you'll have that house you want. You'll have that, that uh, spouse you want. You'll have everything you want if you just be faithful to God. And what we see is this is what they believed, and this is a misnomer because people often suffer because of their faithfulness. And it's not, and often people who are unfaithful, in fact, very wicked, are very prosperous in this world. And uh, we don't have time to talk about all that because uh, we could spend a lot of time in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and other places and, and in the Psalms and, and talk about that. But uh, the point is they believe this. And so God called Amos to go to the north and preach that God is angry about their wickedness and is going to bring them down in judgment. And they're thinking, no, that is not going to happen. If that were true, why are we so invincible? Why are we so strong? And that's the next thing. Not only was, was there national disunity, military superiority, but economic prosperity. Not only were they strong militarily, but economically, they were as wealthy as the nation of Israel had ever been since the time of Solomon as well. And of course, during the days of Solomon, there was this wealth everywhere. And yet, there's a lot of wealth here. We're talking about families that have uh, two homes. They have their winter home and they have their summer home and, and they have their uh, furniture inlaid with ivory. And by the way, I had someone send me an article just, uh, it's been just a few weeks ago where they were digging around up north and have actually found some of those ivory inlays archeologists have that, that were used on furniture during that period. And so this, these, these were things noting wealth to them. And so God tells Amos, go to this people 
that sees themselves as invincible, who are extremely wealthy, and tell them that God is against them and is going to punish them for their sin. And they're like, wrong. Amos, you're wrong. We have all the proof. Just look around you. We have all the proof to show you that God is with us. And it shows our strength is because God is with us and pleased with us. Our wealth because God is pleased with us and is with us. And it just wasn't true. I think about this when I was a kid. Um, this verse, and it shows that we often look at verses in the scripture based upon our own uh, situation. And, and I understand, I can only see through my eyes, right? I mean, I, and so it's just, we can only see through our own eyes. But I'll never forget when I first heard the verse, um, rain falls on the just and the unjust. And I remember hearing that because it automatically made, made me think of my second grade elementary teacher. Her favorite song was, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head. Now that shows how old I am right there, doesn't it? To, to know that song and remember that was popular um, when I was a child. But um, the idea is this, that rain makes you sad. Rain is bad, it's, it's, it's not good. and so. You know, the rain falling and it makes my eyes red. I just want to cry because it's raining. And so when I heard the verse, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, I thought that means bad things happen to everybody. That means it's bad things happen to everybody because rain's bad, it makes you sad, and so there you go. It must mean that, nope, I was completely wrong. And their, their agrarian culture, what is the greatest blessing for them? Rain, rain. And I should have known that because when my dad passed away, my mom who grew up on a farm her entire life and, and you could take her out of the, the country, but you couldn't take the country out of her and she lived with us. She got me in this habit every day. She knew the weather. And every morning now I get up except on Sunday. I, I have a different routine on Sunday morning, but every other day during the week, the first thing I'll do is look at the weather. In fact, I like it now that I have these apps so I can bypass the whole news and just go to the weather. And I'll click on the weather and uh, I'll watch that and see what, what we're looking at. When did I get that? I know who I got that from. I got that from my mom. And why was it so important for her? Because her entire life, their livelihood depended on the weather as farmers. And so I get it. And rain is extremely important and, and we all get that. And for these people, being an agrarian agricultural community, rain was important. So rain falling on the just and the unjust, what does that mean? It means God does good things for the just and even the unjust. Why? Because God is a good God and he is a gracious God. And aren't you glad that God has been good to us even at times when we haven't necessarily been good to him and good to others? And so... God is a good God even to people that aren't good. Now, ultimately, will he judge those who are unrighteous? Absolutely. But he is a gracious, kind, merciful God. And so when we look at this, they don't understand. They think that they've somehow earned God's blessing. When the truth is God has been good to them in spite of their wickedness. You could look if you want to, if you're taking notes, in 2 Kings chapter 14, verses 23 through 27. This passage here is about Jonah, actually. And Jonah lived during this time as well, during the time of Jeroboam. And the Assyrians were a strong nation at this time. And it's interesting, it talks about King Jeroboam. And it says that Jonah preaches a message of blessing saying that God is going to give Jeroboam victory over their en his enemies and is going to expand the boundaries of Israel. But it makes it very clear that Jeroboam was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then it goes on to say, but God had compassion on his people. And that's what we see here. 
So his goodness to them and blessing them with all the stuff, the military and all the, the wealth, it wasn't about how good they were. It's about how good God is and how merciful and, again, gracious he was to them. And so this is something to remember. Another thing we see here, they lived during a time of religious activity, religious activity. They were extremely religious and uh, active in this, offering sacrifices, um, keeping the law um, for the most part. In fact, I saw one commentator say that they kept the law about 96 point some percent. I don't know how he figured that out, uh, a percentage of it, but it is true that they were what we would say today, churchgoers. They were faithful. They tithed. In fact, some of them, it says, it gives the impression they tithed double what they, they had to. I tell you what, when people are tithing double, something's going on, right? You'd think. But yeah, they, they were extremely religious and very active in these things. Um, and so there's a lot of religious activity going on. So what about his message? And I want to spend a the last part of our time here looking at his message. Um, he, ident- he begins his message, look in verse two, it says, he said, the Lord roars from Zion and makes his voice heard from Jerusalem. The pastors of the shepherds mourn and the summit of Carmel withers. So first of all, he identifies the source of his message and it is the Lord. If you look in your text there, it has Lord in capital letters. And uh, I imagine um, you've heard this before, but uh, just in case um, you haven't, uh, when you see in your Bible, especially in the Old Testament, when you see Lord in all capital letters, that is your translator's way of telling you this is the Lord's covenant personal name with Israel. This is the name Yahweh. And so it's not just the word Lord, which is Adonai, but this is Yahweh. It is his personal covenant name to Israel. That's important to remember. And sometimes you'll see in your translations where it has God in those capital letters. It's that same, it's trying to indicate that it's that word that's being used. That's right. And so as, as we look at this, why, why is that important? This is personal to God. This is personal as he delivers this message to his people. He is their God. He is their God, their personal God. He is the one that made covenant with them. It is something that is legal. It is something that is relational. It is something that God has identified himself with his people and his people with him. And that's why, again, when we look in the Bible so often, the idea of covenant is tied to the picture of marriage because there's a legal aspect to it, but there's a a relational aspect to it and that it is a commitment to one another and they have broken this commitment. And so this is extremely personal to God when he speaks to his people, the message that, that Amos is about to deliver to them. And notice how it it comes to them as well. Um, it, It says here that, uh, the Lord roars from Zion. What we have here, it's interesting. When does a lion roar? Um, I really had not paid any attention to this, but in uh, writing the book on Amos several years ago, it's been, um, wow, it's been uh, about 12, 13 years ago now when I wrote that book. But I, I found out that lions don't roar when they're hunting um, because they would scare away their prey. Um, they're quiet, actually, and they're sneaky when they, they do that. But when they roar, it's a warning when some other lion, usually someone is, encro- is encroaching upon their territory. And so they roar saying, you better go the other way or you're going to be in big trouble. And that's the message here God is saying to his people. You had better turn your ways around because you're headed for big trouble, very big trouble. And this is gonna be severe for you. And so just as a lion roars to give warning to the danger that they will bring upon some other creature that's coming in on their territory, God is using this same picture to say, I'm warning you. 
that you had better change your ways or things are going to go very badly for you and I'm going to bring it down upon you. And so this is his message to these people. And it says he makes his voice heard from Jerusalem, the pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the summit of Carmel withers. It's to all of the people, to the grandest city that is Jerusalem, they will hear it. Out in the pastures, they will experience it. And even on Carmel, Mount Carmel, it says withers. In ancient Israel, Mount Carmel was thought of as one of the most beautiful, luxurious places in their land. And uh, that's, uh, that's why, again, um, you see um, the, the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel because it's a fertility cult, um, Baal worship was, and that was a fertile area. And so that was one of their worship places. And what happens here, um, he's saying the most fertile of your places, what is it going to do? It's going to wither. This is what's going to happen. So you think of the very best picture, what you think, he's saying, of your land. And Mount Carmel would have been at the top of that. He says, that's going to be gone. It's going to wither away. That's what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to bring your whole land down. And so after this, beginning with verse 3 and following all the way into the beginning of chapter 2, Amos begins a series of pronouncements of judgments, but he begins these judgments actually against other nations and not against Israel. But we need to keep in mind this, as he preaches this message, he's preaching to the people of Israel. So he's preaching to Israel a message of judgment that God is going to bring upon the nations that are surrounding Israel. And all of these nations, from Israel's point of view, were their enemies. And so Amos, as he begins, he doesn't begin speaking of Israel's issues, but he actually begins pronouncing judgment on all the people that Israel hated that were surrounding them, beginning with Damascus. Notice in verse 3, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Damascus for three times, even four because they thrust Gilead with iron sledges. So Amos reveals in Damascus, of course, you know where that is today. It's present day Syria. Um, the Old Testament often refers to it as Aram, Damascus or Aram, that region, and, um, and sometimes Syria as well. But Amos reveals that the sin of the Syrians or the Arameans was that they actually took Israelite prisoners and they used um, these heavy sledges that were involved in their uh, harvesting grain. They would have these huge sledges with knife-like iron prongs that were curved in them and they would run them over um, the stalks to, to thresh them. And the picture is this, that they laid down their Israelite captives that they had taken in war and they ran these sledges with these sharp iron hooks over them and mutilated them, of course, killing them. And of course, Israel knew this. There was immense hatred toward these people for what they had done. In fact, if you look even today, there's a lot of hatred that goes back and forth between those two regions. And it goes all the way back even before this. But certainly, this was a part of it. And so this is the crime that the people of Damascus committed, treating people as if they have no worth, treating God's people as if they have no worth. And notice then the judgment. Therefore, in verse 4, I will send fire against Haziel's palace, and it will become Ben-Hadad's citadels. I will break down the gates of Damascus. I will cut off the ruler from the valley of Aven, and who, the one who wields the scepter ben, from Beth Eden. The people of Aram will be exiled to Kerr. The Lord has spoken. So 
he is going to bring down all of the strongholds and, and the, the leaders of Aram and bring about this judgment as he sends them into captivity. Second, it's Gaza. Look at uh, verse 6. And we, here we see Gaza using people for profit. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Gaza for three crimes, even four, because they ex exiled a whole community, handing them over to Edom. So the Philistines, they treated others as objects to be exploited for their value. Other people, they were just a means to an end for profit for them. And what they would do is they would capture whole towns and they would take these people and sell them into slavery and making a huge profit from this. And it is something that uh, I've not seen anyone um, that I've known personally um, seeking to take people and sell them into slavery, although I know that goes on in our world and even in places in our, co our country. But um, I do know that I have seen where we will take, look at other people and see them as an object for profit. I go back to um, when I was a kid, uh, my father uh, pastored a church in Willoughby, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland for 11 years. And then we moved to the northernmost uh, um, suburb of Dayton, Ohio, uh, where the airport is in Vandalia, Ohio, and he pastored there for 31 years. And so I grew up there from 12 years old forward until I came to Louisville. Um, I pastored even in Dayton area for a couple years before coming, um, well, actually for about 10 years before coming to Louisville. But uh, I remember when we moved from Cleveland to Dayton. In Cleveland, growing up there, I was 12 years old. Baseball was my life as a kid. I love baseball. In fact, um, I can't take full credit for that because my mom was an athlete, actually. Um, and uh, when I was born, I'm told my dad walked in the hospital room and she was holding me. And she said to him, this one's going to be my ball player. And I had an older brother that was nine years older and she didn't, he didn't get deemed the, the ball player, but I, I was just this little infant. And she says, this is the one. And so I have no memories before baseball. I mean, I, I, it was my life and I was groomed. My poor brother, she'd have him take me out and run drills with me and, and do all sorts of things. So baseball was my life. And I loved watching baseball, even if the Indians were the Indians then. Now they've changed their name, but they were the Cleveland Indians then. And I was a big Indians fan, although about September, they were always about 25 games out of first place. Um, but still, uh, um, I, I enjoyed watching them and I collected baseball cards. The team that I, I, I liked all of baseball so much that almost every team I really liked just because I liked baseball. So if it, they had good players, I enjoyed watching them and uh, I just enjoyed the, the, the game. But there were a couple teams that I just found disgusting to me. One of them was Cincinnati. Now I know you're close to Cincinnati here, but in Cleveland, there's a whole different atmosphere of what we think about Cincinnati than what they do in this region around. And so I could not stand the Cincinnati Reds. I always call it, the first game I went to, they had the um, uh, uh, Riverfront Stadium and they had carpet uh, instead of grass. I'm like, what is this, carpet? Uh, on, and this is what they call that astral turf or whatever. And the ball would hit it and it'd bounce up like 25 feet in the air. I'm like, what, that's not baseball. And there's no, where's the dirt and where's the mud and all this stuff. So anyhow, I just found it all disgusting. Um, so we, we moved down there. They all love the Reds. And I had all these Reds cards. And uh, my best friend, one of my best friends, um, he collected cards too, and we would trade cards. Now he had 1950s Mickey Mantles. He had Willie Mays. He had all these big old time stars. I had these pristine Cincinnati Reds cards and I, I even had books on worth. I knew what they were all worth. Back then, those Cincinnati Reds cards were worth about two or three cents. And that Mickey Mantle card was worth about 10 bucks. At that time, that was a lot of money, especially for a baseball card. So I would, his name was Charlie. And I'd say, Charlie, I'd, I'd get the cards out. 
And I'd hold out Johnny Bench and Pete Rose and all these guys, the big red machine, and I'd hold them out there, Davy Concepcion, and I said, you want these, don't you? And he would literally, he'd start to shake. <clears throat> I said, I want that Willie Mays. I want the 1957 Willie Mays. He said, no, 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 I can't part with that. You know, my dad gave me that. And I said, well, I'd hold them up. You see how pristine these are? They're not even touched. You want these. And he would make the deal. He would make the deal. And I knew I was ripping him off, way ripping him off. The only thing is the Lord has a sense of humor because time has passed. Now guess which cards are worth much more money. Those cards are. That's exactly right. So that, I, I feel a little bit better about that. Um, and also my mom at one point threw away my cards. That was great also. So that, that was another thing. But uh, the deal is I saw Charlie as a mark. Now there's one thing to make a profit in business. That's part of it. There's another thing to pur purposely take advantage of somebody and not to treat them fairly and rightly. And that's how I was treating Charlie at that time. And this is what they did with these people. So we may not be putting people into slavery. And we look at these things in the Old Testament and say, well, that's not us. We don't even have that going on here. But the point of it is, is looking at people and saying, how can I take advantage of them for my profit? And they are just, people are just to be used for me. And certainly that is something that we need to look at. Also, we see here um, Tyre in verse 9. And we see here, it says, The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Tyre for three crimes, even for four, because they hardened or handed over a whole community of exiles to Edom and broke a treaty of uh, brotherhood. Well, the city of Tyre was located on the Mediterranean coast, north of Israel, um, what is in modern-day Lebanon. And it was probably one of the wealthiest cities in the ancient Near East at that time because it was a trade city. It's uh, just about marketing and, and, and trade all over the Mediterranean um, area and into the ancient Near Eastern um, area proper. And so they were very wealthy, and they served as what we might say middlemen in slave trade, among other things. And so we see here um, that they, too, handed over whole communities of exiles. It says to eat them, and so um, probably um, we're talking about Isra Israelites that they took and sold um, to the Edomites into captivity. And then we see Edom in verses 11 and 12. Verse 11, and, and we see with Edom, they were un, theirs was unrestrained hatred and spite toward a brother. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Edom for three crimes, even four, because he pursued his brother with the sword. He stifled his compassion, his anger toward them continually, and he harbored his rage incessantly. Um, what, what we see here is this uh, rage that Edom brought on against the people of God. And um, what's odd about this is the idea of the word brother. Many times in the Old Testament, Edom is referred to as brother to the people of God. Why? Because Israel is named after, well, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. And Jacob's brother was Esau. And instead of treating their relatives rightly, they treated, treated them quite wrongly. And the Edomites were brutal to the people of God whenever they had the opportunity. I always think about the Edomites historically. They're like that, that, that person who's really weak. And there's a situation where someone big takes advantage of somebody else and starts taking their stuff. And Edom's like that little guy that jumps in and starts taking it too. Um, could never stand on their own and never 
handle it themselves, but they're always jumping in and taking advantage of the troubles of, of others um, that have been brought on by somebody else. And that's who the Edomites were and what they often did to Israel. And then in verse 13, we see Ammon. And it says here, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing the Ammonites for three crimes, even four, because they ripped open pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge their territory. And um, the ancient Near East, um, well, this war is brutal. It's, it's a terrible thing. And this is something that in ancient Near Eastern warfare that was not unheard of. This is not just a, a one-time kind of thing here. We can look at ancient Near Eastern records and see where this kind of thing happened. Um, why would they do this? Um, it was a way of uh, basically saying that we want to put an end, an end to you and an end to all your generations after you. We, we want to completely annihilate you. And we want to take all, and it's a brutal way of having done this. And so uh, this is what um, the Ammonites um, had done and, and to the people of Gilead, which, is, which were Israelites. And so next in chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, we see Moab and showing contempt for others. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Moab for three crimes, even four, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. So like the Ammonites, the Moabites were distant relatives of the Israelites. Um, I didn't mention that about the, the Ammonites, but the Moabites and Ammonites um, both um, came from Lot and uh, were distant relatives to the Israelites. But Amos says of Moab that... Uh, they, they burned to lime the, lime the bones of the king of Edom. And uh, what they did to burn to lime, the idea here is they used his um, bones um, to, to actually turn it into lime to use it into construction materials for building their own walls. It's, it's a complete expression of contempt, saying that it's not enough for us to kill you. We're going to use you like you're just material. You're not even worth any kind of respect whatsoever. And so it is really a message of contempt for their enemies to do this. I recall in 1993 watching... The television and seeing an image of a mob in Mogadishu dragging the corpse of an American soldier through the dirty streets of that city. And I have to say, as an, an American, um, I had emotions of anger and revulsion that welled up in me because I realized their utter contempt for this man and his family and for every American as they were doing what they were doing. It's the same thing here that the Moabites were doing. This is their way of saying, we, show, we have complete contempt and complete disregard and no value for you whatsoever. And that's what they were, were doing. And then finally, the seventh nation in this list is Judah. And verses 4 and 5. In verse 4, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Judah for three crimes, even four, because they have rejected the instruction of the Lord and um, have not kept his statutes. The lies that their ancestors followed have led them astray. So what is their sin here? Because they have rejected God's word and not been obedient to it. That's it. Now, it's interesting because we might think, okay, well, of course we're supposed to obey God's word, but this, how are they on this list? And how is it that God says he's going to do all these terrible things to Judah? Um, he's going to consume them with fire and all this. This is bad, but this isn't like ripping open pregnant women and, you know, the terrible things that these other peoples have done. 
So yeah, it's bad, but it's not that bad. No, it, it, it is that bad. In fact, we could argue that it's actually worse because again, these, the, the, the other nations, what they did, they were sins against humanity. They were sins against God, but they were sins against God and the, the humanity that God had put in them. But the sins of Judah, they knew better. They had God's word. They had God's prophets. They had a history of knowing that God had blessed them and done all sorts of just amazing things on their behalf. And what they did, the nations rejected God on a level that was not knowing God nearly in the intimacy that the people of Judah knew God. And so what they did was much more egregious. What's worse? Someone in your neighborhood doing something that uh, is unkind to you or someone in your own home who betrays you? Well, we don't want to be betrayed at all, but it is much deeper when it's someone in our own home than it is an outsider. And so when we see the people of God and what they did, it is personal, it is egregious because they're to be God's people. And this is important to understand. God made a covenant with Israel to keep his commandments. So what, for what purpose? Well, to be a blessing to them, but also to be a blessing to the nations. And so you can look at this, for instance, in Deuteronomy chapter four, Um, one through eight and see there that God gave his law to the people so that when they obey it, it would be a witness to the nations of who God is. When God called Abraham, he said to him in Genesis 12 verses one through three, he says, I've chosen you to bless you so that what? He says this twice, so that you and your descendants will be a blessing to the nations. And so God made a covenant with Israel, not only to be a blessing to Israel, but much greater than that, to be a blessing to to the nations, to be an instrument of blessing. And so when they are disobedient to God's law and they break God's covenant, it's not just about them and God, but it's about God's purpose for them to be a blessing and a witness to the nations. It's much bigger than them. And we need to understand this. Jesus said, In Luke 12, beginning with verse 47, he said, And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone uh, everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to, uh, to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Greater blessing demands greater responsibility. And that's what we see here with this. And so there are several pronouncements made, or or, or why did he make these these, um, pronouncements? I'm going to go quickly with this, and I want to make some final observations and be be done. But um, they serve to get um, um, his audience's attention. Israel despised these people, and so to hear them, uh, hear God say he's going to get them, they loved it. And so they were, they were listening, all ears, about that. These pronouncements also ensnare Israel, though, because what we're going to find is that the kinds of things that the nations were doing were the same kinds of things that Israel was doing. And if the nations are guilty, how much more than the people of God who should know better? And so it ensnares them. Also, there's a shock value to it as they hear what has happened. But here's a part of the shock value. I don't make a whole lot of numbers, but numbers are, are, are something not just to bypass. The number seven um, in the Bible kind of carries the idea of completeness. Notice there are seven nations. So um, Amos gives this message, seven nations. Israel hated all seven of them, even Judah. This is the greatest message we've ever heard, Amos. You can come back. We love you. 
anytime. Let's, hey, let's take up an offering. Let's get this guy to come back. That's, that's how they were. They loved what he said until he got to an eighth nation. And he kept preaching. You see, a preacher's today, three points in a poem, right? And you're done, right? That's what it's supposed to be. No, his was seven points and it should be done. No, no, there's an eighth, it's you. And now he's not so popular. But what he does, he ensnares them by like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, no, well, what about you? No, 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 we've heard enough now. And this is what he does with them. And it also demonstrates God's patience. These messages do. And uh, what we see here is they, they reveal God's concern for how people treat others. And that's important. So what are my final things I want to say here about this? I want to make four observations. Prosperity is not necessarily a sign of God's pleasure with us. Prosperity is not necessarily a sign of God's pleasure with us. And uh, it, it may just be more likely a picture of God's kindness and who he is and not so much about us. And so it's important for us to understand that. Another thing, religious zeal is no substitute for sincere devotion and faithful obedience to the Lord. Religious zeal is no substitute for sincere devotion and faithful obedience to the Lord. I think of Jesus in Matthew 7, verses 21 and 23. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. You lawbreakers. So we can do all these things. But what God is looking for is faithful obedience, sincere devotion, a love for him that's unequaled. A third observation is with greater blessings comes greater responsibility. With greater blessing comes a greater responsibility. We're responsible. The more that you know of God's word, the more you're responsible and the more opportunities you have even to learn God's word that you don't take to do so, you're responsible. I'm responsible. We're responsible for the time that God has given us. We're responsible for the opportunities that God has given us. And we're, we're responsible for all the other things that God has given us to be used for his glory. And with greater blessing comes greater responsibility. And I added one. They've got three on your PowerPoint. I read it over last night, said, I forgot one. So I added it to mine. So I'll add it to yours now. This indicates that God, God indicates he is patient, but there's a limit to his patience. And I didn't mention this. I wanted to say this to the end. Notice with each of these, he says, for three and for four. Do you notice that? Here's the idea of that when he says this. For three sins or three transgressions and for four, the idea is this. He's been letting this go on a while. It's not like a one-time thing and he's, he's bringing down judgment. No, he's been patient with them and he's allowed them time. But the point is this. Three and for four also, three and four adds up to what? Seven. And I think he's saying enough's enough. Enough's enough. Seven, that number of completion, I've had enough. And God is patient, but we should all understand there is a limit to God's patience. And he'll allow us to go on sometimes for a bit, but it won't go on forever. And it's important for us to understand that. We need to understand that, first of all, for our, our own selves, but also, I take great encouragement in this, that this is true for the world as well. And we live in a world that is truly in turmoil. But God is still God. And he's a patient God. And I'll trust him in his patience. But I also trust and know by his word that there's a limit to that. And so that makes me take, take a moment and look at me. But also it encourages me as I look at this world as well.
And, uh, and also, I have to say this. You ever get bugged and think, God, why don't you just do something about this? I'm that way all the time. It's a good thing I'm not, I wasn't in, in Moses' day, because when God said to Moses, let's wipe them out, I said, okay, sign me up. Let's wipe them out right now. Let's be done with these, this thing. And I figured out that God is patient with me, and so I reluctantly understand that, well, if he's going to be patient with me and I like that, I guess it's okay if he's patient with others. And we need to understand that the God who is patient with us is patient with others, but there is an end and there is a limit to that patience.